I want to mention that I I also read your book, which I appreciated a lot as well. I have uh, a, a love a loved one going through a, a tough situation. I appreciate you saying that. That thank you. I know. Um, Eventually, it seems like it will never end, and then it and then it does end, and then you're on the other side of this. Even people in our community who have had seven, eight, nine year sentences, it's hard to imagine it ending. And then many of them are now on our webinars talking about that experience. It's just it's surreal. Recording, but it is ending. So, what, welcome everyone. Joa, would you mind sending me a, a an email afterwards? Um, I have a, another resource I'd like to to share with you. So, I'll, I'll, I'm going to put a note here in chats. Uh, Joanne to my, mm -hmm. my email address, JPY Caller Advice. And if anyone, by the way, would like the resource we're going to send, uh, I'd like to send you an additional book, Joanne, uh, Thank that, you. that you'll really find value in. And in fact, I'll, I'll mention that right now. Okay? Thank you. Scott, if Thank you, you could begin muting everyone, and then yeah. I'll mute myself as the co host. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. And you can hear me right now, Scott? Yes. Thank you. So let's let's get started. Great, grateful everyone to see you every week. Thank you to those of you who are new. Welcome to our community. Our goal is to help you prepare, regardless of the, the stage of the journey that you're in. As a reminder, uh, these webinars are recorded. So if you have a loved one who's unable to watch or you want to relay this to them, we will send out the replay of this webinar on Saturday. As you can absolutely expect that. I will continue to let people in. Scott can do the same. As a reminder, our team encourages you, if you have the willingness to, to learn, to spend a few minutes every day on Prison Professors, where we're continuing to share tons of, of free content with hopes that it will help you. And five, 10 minutes a day, slow and steady wins the race, will go a very long way. A number of people have asked about uh, books that Michael has written. Many of them, as you know, we give away so much free stuff. Many of them are on our website. We do have a, a resource page on prison professors under our books, many of whom we, we give you the PDFs. If, if you have interest in purchasing a book, not here to sell books. If you do the resources, go to the nonprofit. But many of you are asking and asking what books we read. So we have a free copy of the audiobook of Earning Freedom. But, but I would encourage you, Scott, if you could put a link to our resource page here, I think that would be helpful. Any other resources I mentioned in this webinar, whether it's the resource page, top 10 surrender list, how to avoid problems in prison, we will put all of those, all of those will go in the replay that we send out on Saturday. Today we're gonna to interview and we're gonna speak with a few clients. Uh, someone had said to me, I love hearing from you and Michael, but I'd like to hear from some people who have gone through it. So I said, in other words, you're telling me to stop talking which I can do. So in a few minutes, we're going to turn it over to, to Ron. We're going to speak with Amy. This is being recorded by, by the way, by Ron and Amy and Ryan, if he can join us. He was recently released from prison and hear their stories about self-advocacy. And Lori, the reason your volume just went off is because we muted everyone. If and when you want to speak, just unmute yourself. And if you have questions, just put the hand up and I'll call on you. Before I get into some of the self of advocacy and Ron's story. I had mentioned this morning in an email that I wanted to share kind of five, spend a few minutes on five stories I've heard from people who are home from prison. And some of them are severe, some of them are not severe. As many of you know, when you go to, some people will call time in a minimum security camp, a, a fat farm. And many people go there and they get into great shape, they exercise. And for many people, especially who don't need to return to work, find getting fitter and stronger, the best part of the experience. Many of them have said the time in prison saved my life. It added 20 years to my life. I was ready to drop dead. I received a call from someone who has been home for about two years and he lost a hundred pounds in prison. And within two years, he's put it all back on. So my goal on these webinars isn't to give fitness advice, but rather to convey to you that your prison adjustment should be commensurate with the life you want to lead when you come home. There's a conversation I had extensively with Michael Santos when I was exercising for six hours a day. Then he helped me understand how the decisions I was making in prison were going to relay, relate to the life I led after prison. So even though this person who lost 100 pounds in prison had resources, he came home and he began working. And what happens? You don't have eight hours a day to walk around the minimum security camp. And now 
Uh, this prisoner or former prisoner is dealing with a great deal of depression, he told me, because his biggest accomplishment in prison, losing the weight, it's all gone and then some. And now because he's working and busy, he's like, I will never be able to to lose that weight again. I kind of want to go back. I wish I, I wish I had six more months in prison. So it sounds funny, but it's very common. So the take away is we discussed preparing for prison. Mr. Carper, your son's in prison. Please relay this to, to Scott. Kent, anyone, Ron's getting ready to go in for six years. We're going to talk about his story. Exercise and dosages you can maintain. If you can exercise eight hours a day in prison, that means you're going to exercise eight hours a day when you come home. But this, this former physician was devastated at the weight gain and very depressed. A second story I want to share is someone who was, we, we frequently say in our community, like, be careful what you wish for. And someone was granted nine months in the halfway house. Case manager um, appreciated his efforts. He worked pretty hard. It appeared in prison. Gave him nine months in the halfway house. Didn't document the journey. Goes to the halfway house. Presumes for some reason that it's just like magic that he's going to be able to work for himself. And the case manager is like, you've got to be kidding. Absolutely, I'm not going to allow you to work from home. We have relationships with local employers. Go work there. And all work is honorable, but I know, as I've said before, you, you may not want to work at KFC or Jamba Juice, or in this instance, they have a relationship with like a local donut shop, which is where he will be working. So just because we interview people like Hugh Hurwitz, the former director of the BOP, or John Gustin, who say, yes, you can work from home, it is a mistake. Presume it's an absolute. If you haven't documented by way of your release plan what the business is, who will be your supervisor, what you will be getting paid, why you have a skill set that allows you to do this, if you haven't documented it and build it up while you are in prison and shared that work with your probation officer while you are in prison, who will then share it with the people in the halfway house, it is foolish to believe you're just going to come home, shake their hand and say, I'd like to go work for myself for the next nine months. You're going to get the response of, You've got to be kidding me. There's no evidence to support it. So now, what did this person say? He says what a lot of people say when they're having a tough time in the half playoff. Well, Scott, can you jump in and guess what this person said he'd like to do with the next nine months rather than go work at the local donut shop? What do you think he wants to do, everyone? My, my guess is he wants to actually go back to prison and walk around the track all day and not worry about grocery shopping and cooking food and the rest of life. He doesn't want to serve glazed donuts. So he, yeah, that too. He he doesn't want to serve the glaze. He'd rather be back in prison. So don't watch the interviews with John Gustin or Chris Maloney, but hear what they say. They say it's possible if you've documented why. Everyone in prison said to me, and I used to tell Michael, they, they're telling me I can't work with you. I can't work with felons. And he'd say, are you documenting it? Are you showing why? Is there a market? Do you have the skill set? Day one, it was approved. This prisoner wants to go back to jail for nine months. And he ain't going back, by the way. They're not letting him go back. Number three, someone on probation, on probation for about two weeks. And after he's on probation for two weeks, and guess what happened in the third week? He's back in front of the sentencing judge for a probation violation. Why? He didn't read the judgment and commitment order that says you cannot establish or open up an LLC or line of credit without permission from your probation officer. So just like that, the dude opens up an LLC, PO finds out about it, owes money back in front of of the judge, judge gave him a warning. If it happens again, goes back to prison or extends the time of supervised release. You can't open up LLCs. You can't open up bank accounts. I mean, imagine you're two weeks into your journey and you're back in front of the judge within three weeks. Not great for the release plan or your eventual goal to get off supervised release early if you can't follow instructions. You know what judges like to say when this happens? My God, there you go again. I, I was, you were a bad bet when I gave you a downward departure. Please, probation violations happen and they will get you returned to prison or they will extend your term of supervised release. Number four, someone called, he's like 30, and we try to help here as best we can. I've helped with people on this webinar and it has not helped. Received a call from a 35 year old gentleman who told me that while he was in prison, his bank froze his account. He did not have a power of attorney. They liquidated the account. They cashed the check. And now it's a taxable event because he's less than 59 and a half. And he took a distribution from his IRA. He's got to pay the tax. So he could not find a new bank. I've tried to help you find some of you a new bank or brokerage firm. Have not always been successful. You need to do what I did when I came home from prison. There were days I would sit at my desk for 12 hours and I would call everyone, every bank. I would call every 
everyone I knew and ask if they would call in a favor to have someone take my money. It was the easiest sales job in the history of a world for a banker or a broker. Hello, just take my money. I don't need your sales process. I'm sure you're great. Just take my money, please. This person had his retirement account liquidated because he was unable to find a new broker. If you're in prison, there is a chance they freeze your assets. The first thing we discuss in our top 10 self-surrender checklist is power of attorney, a primary point of contact. If God forbid this happens, you need someone to advocate for you. And we have had people who literally play like musical chairs with their money. I'm not kidding. They will find a bank for like two months knowing the firing is coming. They'll find another bank for two months. You're just kicking it along a little bit as long as you can until hopefully someone sticks with you. So that was very disappointing for this person. And after it's been liquidated and there's a taxable event, he now has 60 days to put the money back. So he's scrambling. He's doing the work to find a, a bank that he should have done before or while he was in prison. Number five, uh, a prisoner or defendant owed money. He wasn't working. His wife was. And he got off to a very bad start with his probation officer because he tried to say he shouldn't pay the 10% monthly restitution payment because he isn't working, even though his wife is. Got off to a very bad start. You can't tell the judge, I'm sorry, I'm going to make amends and work to pay my victims back, even if it, in this case, it's the IRS, and then make a big deal when you don't want to pay the money. It doesn't go well. What is a probation officer going to say? I can tell you what they're going to say because we've been doing this a long time. Your wife makes money. Does she help pay your health insurance, your mortgage, your rent, your groceries, your, your car? Yes. Well, she can contribute to those expenses. Her income can help pay the $500 a month we want to pay. That's the approach rather than fighting. He is off to a horrific start with probation. Is it likely he gets off probation early? No. Scott, for example, has been on probation for about nine minutes. In the last week, he's been to California and Florida. Not by accident, because everyone in prison will say to you, you can't travel when you start probation. It's going to take six months before you can travel. Like I just said, Scott came to see us in California from Idaho. Now he's in Florida and Naples. I don't know where he's, where he's going next. I just know that he has permission to travel. Not by accident. If you owe money, pay it, please. Now, any questions Any questions on these five, five kind of sad case studies I shared with you before we proceed? Anything concerning or scary that pops out to any of you? Anything at all? Okay, if, you, if and when you have questions, please let us know and, and we will absolutely call on you. Before we turn yes, it over- I, I, have a, I have a question. So, yes, talk, so, talk. so okay. should, I, should I try to open more bank accounts now? Uh, before I'm, I'm in pre pre, you know, pre it, We want you to be proactive. Our whole work is about, we can't guarantee what's going to happen in sentencing. We can't predict the future. We can't change the past. Some of you create a best-in-class release plan that your case manager loves. Some of you may create and the case manager says, I'm not going to read this. We can't predict what we're going to do. We encourage you to be proactive and to advocate and to build a new record, to cultivate relationships. Not call in favors, but prove worthy of it. So if I were you and I was you, be better than me. I sat around thinking the bank wouldn't fire me because I only had an 18-month sentence and they froze my assets six days into my prison term, right? Joanne, you mentioned you read lessons from prison. So you read about that story. It made my initial adjustments in prison harder. So if you haven't been fired, great. I work under the idea if you pled guilty to a white collar crime, money laundering, bribery, corruption, wire fraud, these are really bad terms for a bank, okay? And they just don't want the risk. So if you haven't been fired, great. If I were you- No, I did get fired by Bank of America and American Express. Yeah, B, of a, B, B of A is the worst. I know that B of A, is the, they fired me too. But I, but I still have, you know, uh, Chase and I have yes. Citibank and- you know, I'd I'd be I'd be cultivating relationships. I'd be if you've yet to go to prison, I would have a. a we're going to talk about this in a moment. A primary point of a, a power of attorney set up, a point of contact, so you're not blowing through all your phone minutes trying to find someone to to take your money before they cash out and send you a check. So cultivate relationships as best you possibly can. So if it happens, you're you're ready to pounce. Every other day, I get a message from someone in our community asking. And I, I want you to know, I too, am, I too am always trying. I got this message yesterday. I know you are busy. When you have a chance, please give me a call. Citibank just canceled my account. Which brokerage firm should I go to? Every other day I get that message. So you're able to stick with Citibank or, or Chase. Others get fired. It's very random. I'm with Wells Fargo. I can tell you the Bank of the West fired everyone. Yet I have a client, we have someone in our community who was a money laundering charge. He got eight years. He's still with them. Some get by. It's random. Prepare into the idea they're going to fire you and say, we don't want your business. I don't want you to be caught off guard. Now, for the Thank next you. five, you're welcome. 
for the next few minutes before I turn it over to, to Ron and hear his story, I want to quickly go through our top 10 surrender checklist. And you may be wondering, why are we doing this? I can answer the question. This only works if you actually do the work. Like it, it sounds so obvious, but we have someone on, on, who didn't work with our team who attended webinars, like seven webinars, but I learned immediately after surrender to prison, his spouse called and she was so nice, but she's like, Joe is confused. He doesn't know why he's not getting his first step back to credits. He's been in prison for three days. He is very upset about his bunk and his job. Like, how does he get a better bunk and a better job? He is just really like lost and, and, and confused. And people are telling him that like, because he owes money and the government's going to take like $200 a month for his restitution, someone said he can have money go to their books so he can maximize his spending. And therefore, money that I send to him won't go to restitution. Is it a good idea? Now, this might seem like, how could this person, how could that happen? It's very, these things happen in prison. People are confused about how to get a better job or a bunk. They want their first act, act credits. I understand. But this is person, someone, according to his spouse, who attended seven webinars. Now, I think we communicated it clearly, but there's got to be follow-up. There's got to be work, which is why we send you the videos with the judges and the subject matter experts and lesson plans. I mean, we send you tons of information. He chose not to go through it, which is why he's now scrambling and struggling several days in his prison term instead of doing what? Building his release plan, looking for a job that makes sense for him given his goals. He's beginning to associate with people that are telling him he can increase his spending in his commissary by sending them money. He's vulnerable. He may seize that opportunity. And these are the sorts of prisoners that get off to bad starts. Within six months, they're using iPhones. If you're here, we love it. We're grateful that you're here, but follow through and do the work. And if you're unsure, ask questions. We'll stay on this webinar for two, 24 consecutive hours. We promise to be on as long as necessary to answer all of your questions. Now, top 10 quickly list. Prepare to document the journey. It can be through a blog, a newsletter. All of it should be built around your hub, which is the release plan. If you surrender to prison without your release plan, you're not ready for federal prison. Number two, we just discussed this, a primary point of contact. Have someone in your community with the power of attorney who probably manages your visitation list so you're not blown through emails and phone calls, who's coming and whatnot. That person should get used to checking BOP.gov before someone visits to see if prisons, if that prison is open. For example, we have myriad clients right now in, in Pensacola. Someone surrendered with COVID. And just like that, visitation is back. I checked this two days ago. Visitation was closed. So it's a good idea to that primary point of contact should check that prison. And they can even call because sometimes it, stay, it says it's still closed. It could be open. But Pensacola two days ago was closed. Now it's open for visitation this weekend. Have that primary con point of contact manage your uh, your visitation list so people aren't driving for seven hours only to learn only to learn that it's closed number three understand the financial implications we encourage changes are coming and what i mean is while restitution has always been kind of voluntary it's kind of like voluntary and mandatory i use the analogy when i was in college playing baseball we had involuntary we had voluntary practice if i didn't go go, the coach would volunteer not to play it. So it's really required, okay? But there are many people who don't pay it. There are consequences. In time, it will be vol it will be mandatory, and they're going to be taking larger amounts. We have someone in our community that take 200 bucks a month. I think the first $75 a month cannot be touched. But if you owe money, we encourage you to form a budget every month in prison. You can live very well in prison on three, four, or 500 bucks. We have some people in our community who spend a thousand bucks a month. Why? Well, Michael Santos, for example, was is a prolific writer. He would sit down and write a whole book on core links at five cents a minute. That's why some of his monthly bills would be a thousand bucks, but he was building this business, this business from prison. It could be more expensive, but you should understand what it will cost to live in prison, along with the financial implications of them taking a restitution payment in prison together with banks potentially uh, firing you. Okay, number four creating a deliberate reading list. If you have not built your reading list into your release plan, you're not ready for you're not ready for prison. That reading list should include how many books you're going to read, why are you reading the books, what steps will you take to record what you've read, what have you learned from the book, how will it help you in prison, and how will it contribute to your life upon release. We'd encourage you to document it, share it with your network, and also share it in your release plan 
and with your case manager. It's of no value unless you have a brilliant mind to read a book, say you've read a hundred books and you can't retain any of it or share the work or what you've read. It's kind of like you're watching a movie. In this list, and this will come out on Saturday and I'll replay here 10 books that we recommend, but of course it's gonna be based on your own specific skill set, what you're hoping to learn. Journaling and writing plan. Again, this comes back to the release plan. You should be working on this now. Uh, last week, I filmed a video with a, a Jennifer Shaw, someone who just surrendered to prison for six and a half years. Her first blog is, is going to be coming out today. And that first week is really going to chronicle what book she's read, how she's been productive. She's building it into her release plan. It's one thing to say it, and it's another thing uh, to do it. She's had a very productive first week because of the work that she's done, but she's writing every day. And that was the final piece of advice I gave her or any of you. Commit to writing five minutes a day in prison. The day you surrender to prison, it might feel like a shock going through that intake process, squatting and coughing the strip search. I guarantee you two days later, you're going to see it differently. But if you try to write about it two days later, it's going to feel different. Time in memorial, time in reflection, it won't be as big a deal as what I'm getting at. That day, you should memorialize it. Commit to writing for five minutes a day. And guess what you have? By the time you're done, you have a book, a book you can share with your kids, your family. Write for five minutes a day. It's not hard. Preparing your personal belongings. Ron, I'm coming to you in three minutes. Uh, prepare personal belongings. What are you going to surrender with? The Bible, your wedding ring, presuming it's not too ostentatious. The ring cannot exceed the value of $100. Some people have gotten in with their release plan. Someone recently did not. They called us from the prison parking lot. They won't let me bring in my release plan. What do I do? It's the reason we encourage all of you to send the release plan to yourself in the mail that morning. You'll get it a mail call the next day. Someone recently wasn't able to go in with their contact list. Very rare, a little odd. Put it in your put it in the mail that morning. Okay, so your release plan, your contact list. Um, have we have all the resources we send you on how to send money, how to set up email, how to send mail, and all that good stuff. Uh, but you want to prepare to surrender with medications, which is number seven, right? You should be going through the BOP formulary list so you understand what you can and cannot take with you. We've covered your communication and success plan. By the way, if any of you are going through the drug program or you are going through programming in general, they read emails, phone calls are recorded. We would encourage you not to tell a drug coordinator how much you need treatment and then email your spouse or son to say, yeah, the SARDAP program is okay. It is what it is. I just want the time off. You'll look like a contradiction. They're going to think you say one thing and do another. If you are going to communicate about programs, make sure you communicate what you're learning, how it's helping you, and give credit to your case manager for encouraging you to do the work. And by the way, sound like a broken record, build it into your release plan. Number nine, create your quadrant theory for decision making. Again, we want you to assess to the do your behaviors in prison. Are they high risk, high reward? Low risk, high reward, and vice versa. For example, you know, watching TV all day is probably low risk, low reward. Some people would actually argue it's high risk because a lot of arguments happen in the TV room, certainly low reward. Building a business in prison, high risk, high reward. Higher risk because more scrutiny could be on you if you're writing a book or a blog. Uh, other prisoners may take notice if you're putting it out online. At times, family members may send in your work to their loved one. Like, why aren't you as productive as Scott, who's writing and documenting his journey all day. So we'd encourage you to assess your behavior in prison by way of this quadrant and then hold yourself accountable. What quadrant do you find yourself in? Then last but not least, engineering your release plan, which should be an utter obsession with you as you get ready to go to prison. That said, I'm going to call on our friend Ron, who attends every webinar, worked with our team for a while. Ron, I'm going to shut up now. Let us listen, hear a little bit about your, your story and what the ultimate result was. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Justin. So uh, I understand that that all of us are at different stages of this journey, uh, um, as difficult as it is. But uh, mine happens to be post sentencing. But what I have learned uh, that that uh, Justin thought I should share with the group is the value of, of the true value of self advocating. Uh, Justin, Michael, they say it to us week after week after week. And what I found out found out is no matter where you are in this journey self-advocating is is crucial and, and the other thing that and maybe this is redundant to some of you it wouldn't have been to me uh, i learned this but self-advocating does not mean you have to do it by yourself all it means is you're doing it for yourself you have a whole team of people in this community that will help you 
Um, you have white collar advice, which, and again, this isn't a sales pitch. They don't pound on white collar advice. They don't pitch it to us on these webinars, but why everyone on this uh, uh, webinar is not using white collar advice if they have the ability to do so is beyond me because their help is invaluable. Um, uh, for my process, uh, I did not find the community until after I was found guilty and went to trial. I wish I'd found them a lot earlier. Uh, I spent week after week listening to the webinars, going over the same old stuff, and constantly the, the constant telling me that I have to do the work, I have to do the reading. And it was difficult first, uh, but when I started to grasp what they were, what they were telling us, uh, I started to see value. And, and unfortunately, the value you may not see for months. And, and even when you see the value, you don't know whether it's uh, whether it was done in your in your work on your personal narrative or whether it was the work done on your allocution statement, uh, whether it was your release plan. You're never sure exactly where it is. But if you follow the advice of this group, uh, you will put yourself in a position to succeed, which is what happened to me. And uh, uh, to try to cut my story short to get to the point, um, when I was found guilty, because of the point system, and those of you who have, have not been to sentencing yet, but your pre-sentence report will come out with a point system. And that point system will, will, will turn out a, a, uh, a, sentence guide, a sentence recommendation. And, and it's very black and white. And uh, uh, it, it really takes out the human portion, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, of the process. But in my case, because of the amount of money that the primary perpetrator had uh, taken from victims, it put my points, I can't remember, I want to say it was around 32, but uh, nonetheless, the original the original guidelines going to be recommended to the judge to use as just that guidelines was 14 years. And that was shocking for me, considering that my attorney was one as I was writing a half million dollar check for attorney fees that said I would never see a day in jail. Uh, so 14 years was shocking. Um, however, I did stick with the program. I followed the advice. I did the work as it related to the uh, my personal narrative. I submitted it. I worked with Larry in, in the group. Those of you who haven't worked with Larry, he's, again, he's invaluable. I did my character letters. I, I followed the program and had blind faith in what I was being told was true. Um, and what I learned is when I, when I got to the sentencing hearing, which is the next big step once you're found guilty or you plead guilty, and, and until you get that sentence hearing, you really don't know what your future entails. It's hard to plan. You don't know how long you're going to be away from your loved ones. It's a difficult time. Uh, but by the time I got to my, my sentencing hearing, I felt pretty comfortable. I had done the work. I had done the work. I, I knew what to expect. I had worked enough with, uh, with Larry and Justin and Michael uh, to know what was in front of me. And I also knew that the only chance I had was to get a downward variance from those guidelines. And that has nothing to do with your attorney. When you go in at that sentencing hearing, that judge is going to look at you and the work you've done. Uh, uh, and going in there and saying the jury didn't get it right is not doing the work. And, and it was fortunate for me that I went in, the judge, uh, through my process, recognized I'd done the work. He had touched on my personal narrative. He touched on uh, uh, my character letters. He touched on the volunteer work I'd done with prison, prison professors. Just about every point I had worked on, he mentioned during that sentencing hearing. Um, he chastised me for, for, I should have been smarter, all those things, so on and so forth. But the bottom line, when he did render his sentence, he went to six years. And six years uh, uh, compared to 14 is significant. More than likely, I will be with my family again in less than three years, probably 2.8 years. I calculated it. But what I've learned, which is so critical, self-advocating, doing the work, it does pay off. It paid off for me. Uh, and I'm convinced, had I not done this process, the outcome for me would have been much worse. If I would have gone in there without the leadership of these guys, um, I probably would have gotten a 10 to 12 year sentence. Well, so, so let me ask you this question because there was something you had shared in the message you sent to Michael and me that was profound. As we say in our work, it's understanding the stakeholders, mm. the yeah, prosecutor, yeah. the probation officer, 
the judge, they're going to portray you for really bad decisions you've made. And I, I shared this story years ago. We heard Judge, I heard Judge Pearson, a judge in, in Ohio, speak on stage. And she said something like, I kind of discount what a lawyer says because they're paid to say it. I also sort of discount what the U.S. attorney says because they have their own interest, right? So you have these right. competing interests. So I really want to hear from the defendant. What I think your mitigation strategy did well, a lot of things, but you had the judge kind of criticizing the government for, for trying to portray you as a leader when, when you were not. And I think only you could have done that, that mitigations. Can you kind of touch on what, how the judge, how the government tried to portray your role in this case compared to how the judge viewed it? I'd love, I'd love to. And, 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 and it's a good point because I could not go in there and say that I was not the, the mastermind. I wasn't the, the lead guy in this, in this scheme. Me just saying that would not have worked with the judge. Uh, the, the judge actually chastised uh, uh, the government and said that it, it was obvious to him and everybody else that uh, I was not the mastermind in this program. Uh, I, was, uh, I was involved. I should have known better. Uh, but he chastised them. I was not the mastermind. And I think to Justin's point, he did not come to that conclusion uh, on uh, just randomly. He came to that conclusion by the work I had done. He had obviously spent the time to read the character letters, to read my personal narrative, uh, to read my allocution statement. All those things put together, uh, he was able to formulate that conclusion. It just didn't happen. Uh, so it's a very good point. So recently, we, we worked on a, an allocution for someone, and the person made one change to the end of the letter that said, essentially, don't send me to prison. And, and I, like, we understand it. Or it's like you standing outside of your case manager's office saying, I want to get home to my family. Here's something that judges have told us and case managers have told us. They know you don't want to go to prison, and your case manager knows you want to get home to your family. So rather than telling them, rather than Ron telling them, I'm not the mastermind, maybe some willful blindness, maybe I should have done more, but I'm not the mastermind. Rather than just telling them, you know what they're going to say? Sure, you sure you weren't. <laughs> of course you weren't. You can't, you don't tell them, you show them. And one thing that, that Ron did well, and I want this to be some infomercial, but if we talk about advocacy, in a webinar a while back, I said, raise your hand if you agree with your plea agreement and no hands went up. Part of the reason some of you didn't agree with your plea agreement and did your lawyer know all the facts and was he able, he or she able to fully negotiate for you with the U.S. attorney as your advocate? So Ron invested the time to under, understand his story. He then educated his lawyers, even though he went to trial, that mitigation work left off. So don't tell them what you want. You've got to show them. You've got to build it. And the result of that should be, you know, a better outcome. Now, Ron, I also want to mention this to you because there's a chance you could I got 14 years. And I think we, I spoke with Ron a few weeks ago or via text. And he said, you know, even if I get the number, I still am grateful for what you guys did. So even if you got 14 years, Ron, was there, because there are some people, Ron, to be transparent in our community on this webinar right now, who got sentences that were higher than they wanted. And they're, right. they're, they're, they're not jealous that you got a shorter outcome. But I wish I had a better judge. I wish things went differently. Even if you got a higher number, was there value and dignity in doing the work rather than sitting around all day, like living in a closet? Talk about, mm -hmm. even if you got a bigger number, how you'd have felt. No question about it. I, matter of fact, I had spent endless nights as, as I went through this process, trying to evaluate everything we all evaluate. Where did I go wrong? What should I have done different? Uh, but the most important thing that I, I kept telling myself is every single day, I was going to keep doing work that give me the best possible, and I, it sounds so corny, but the best possible outcome. And, and, and as I worked really hard to do that, and I had, I had more days that I went backwards than forwards, but I just, I just kept at it because, and, and as I approached the sentencing hearing, there was a sense of calmness with me because I knew I had done all that there was I could do. So, and, and whatever my sentence was or, or, or was going to be rendered, it was my job to do it, and and there was no quit. But but it was I did not walk into that sentencing hearing thinking I wished I had done this, I wished I had done that. I knew with certainty I'd done everything that I should have. And and I, I want to before we jump off, I want to touch on that allocution statement because I think it's important for anybody who might be in that process. Larry helped me with mine, mm -hmm. and I initially sent him a four page allocution statement. And the reason it was four pages long is it is there was probably uh, one page of, of true content 
the other three pages were making excuses for myself. And uh, and Larry, the way he's always worked with me, but he comes back with a one and a half page allocution statement. And I first read it and, and I was upset. And, and the reason I was upset is because what I was reading was true. And, and as I argue, argued or debated it with Larry, his point to me was, Ron, this is not about you giving the judge excuses for where you're at right now. It's it's to explain to the judge why you were you where you are today, and to take accountability. And sure. uh, and he he could not have been more true. So, Ron, I appreciate you sharing that with us, and and also, besides the outcome, Ron touched on what the sentence will be. Right? Right. You get six years and then he'll avoid problems in prison, get the 15 percent off, get the year for the first step act. And there could be early release if there's a substance abuse program and all those details. And then before you know it, it's sort of like, my goodness, I could be home in like 28 or 30 months, which is relatively quick when you consider 14 years down to six years. Even someone on this webinar right now is getting ready to go in next week for nine years. And the lawyer said you're going to serve nine years less you know, 15%. And it's like, oh my goodness. But then you even you hear nine years with good time, drug program, halfway house, but also we're hoping that more reform comes down the road. And I want all of you to prepare for that possibility. So Michael Santos wrote Earning Freedom when I was alongside him in prison in 2008. Earning Freedom paves the way for the first step back that passed in 2018. The idea that prisoners can get incentives to earn their way home that was foreign eight, nine, or 10 years ago, and yet it passed in 2018. As you know, the part of the reason I lead these webinars every week is Michael is training and teaching in prisons and jails across the country, advocating for change, training staff, training prisoners, and we're hoping that the First Step Act is just the first step. What if in time furloughs come? Now, furloughs ex exist now, but what about a scenario where you leave the prison and go back to work? Well, who do you think qualifies for that? It's the, the person who can convey or convince a case manager they're, they're worthy of it. A case manager is only going to make a recommendation if they think that you're a good bet. They're not going to let you go home early or qualify for a potential furlough if that comes down the road. If they, if they think you're going to reoffend, they're going to make the bet with somebody who's done the work. It's the reason some people on a five-year sentence get three months and four months in the halfway house. The other guy gets a year, same sentence, same crime. Why? Because you're dealing with human beings and it's subjective. And if they think you've done the work and you've documented it, and you're not going to reoffend and potentially cost them their job or make them look bad. You're more likely to get liberty in things that you want, but you can't tell them you've got to show them. With that said, I'm Ron, thank you for, for speaking. Pleasure. I want to talk to Ryan. Ryan, are you with us? Yep, I'm here, Justin. Ryan's in the Windy City, must be freezing in Chicago. Ryan was recently released from prison, worked with our team on a release plan. I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Congratulations on your release, by the way, and thank you for talking to us about your advocacy and the response you got from your case manager and now probation officer now that you've been released. So thank you so much for contributing, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. So to give everybody a little bit of context, I'm literally sitting in the halfway house in downtown Chicago. Um, I surrendered to a camp in Thompson, Illinois, and with a sentence of a year and a day. Um, you know, I had a mantra going into it before my surrender date was I was going to do everything possible every day to get home as soon as possible. That was my guiding line as I woke up each day pre-surrender, post-surrender, the entire time. Was I doing something that day that would help that cause? And prior to it, I soaked up as much information as possible. I watched all these webinars. I listened to all the podcasts. And when I reached out to Justin and his team for help, um, when I was on that phone call, my wife handed me a sticky note and it said, if you get home one day sooner, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of carried me through just that little sticky note. I still have it. I put it in my night side table. I'm going to hold it dear for the rest of my life. When I got to Thompson, um, as as Justin mentions, that first day, yep, it's a uh, it's eye opening. It's a it's a deer in the headlights look for everybody that's going there. But you will survive and you will get through it. I was able to bring in my release plan um, prior to surrendering. Working on my release plan became my job. That's what I did every day for about a month, preparing for surrender. I took um, the 
kind of the outline that I think actually was Michael's original outline, which, you know, reading Michael's, it's like looking over a doctoral release plan. And I was just hoping to get it mine to a community college level to, to equal what he had done. And I walked into the camp with a copy of it. I had also left a copy with my wife. So when I went in to meet with my case manager for the first time, um, she had my release plan sitting on the desk in front of her, which was great because when you hand it off, when you're going through intake, you don't know what paperwork's going to make it. You, you don't know what's going to happen. And I saw it sitting there and I was very thankful for that. She looked at me and she said, this is one of the best release plans I've ever seen. You should honestly teach a class in it. And I, I took that with a great deal of relief. Um, because shortly after that, and keep in mind, this is the first time I'm meeting with her. And this is after my a &O, which everybody will go through within the first couple of weeks is kind of your orientation there. Um, she told me that I would be, uh, was being submitted to go to Halfway House for February 1st. So keep in mind, to give you an idea of the dates again, I surrendered on October 5th. I'm meeting with my case manager within the first 30 days and finding out that I'm gonna be going to a Halfway House February 1st. Um, I was shocked. I, I went for a long walk on that track and I just couldn't believe it because I had kind of, anticipated that I was going to be at the camp for somewhere between six and nine months, possibly 10 months. Within my first 30 days, I found out that they were scheduling me to be released after four months. Um, the release plan helped with that a ton. I followed that guideline. She, there, there are some interesting things that also happened with it. Um, she had said that she passed it along to my halfway house. Um, I get to the halfway house and I find out she did not, and he was not aware of my release plan at all. Um, I had my wife bring a copy of my release plan that I had updated, um, that I had shown. I had updated things, classes that I took while I was at camp, books I had read, you know, everything that Justin talked about doing, I followed that plan to a T with that release plan. So when I, the case manager at the halfway house said, no, I don't have it, I was immediately able to take out of a folder and hand it to him. Here's my release plan. And his eyes were shocked because when you take a document that's about 20 to 25 pages long and set it in front of them, it opens up their eyes. It makes you stand out from the rest of the people that are there. Um, people take, take note. The other great thing about that is we help with um, getting my work privileges from the halfway house, helping me possibly to get sent home to home confinement having that release plan, being able to send that to my probation officer, being able to send that to the RRM, being able to take nuggets out of it when I'm writing letters to these people as well, saying, this is what I said I was going to do going into camp. This is what I did at camp. This is what I, I followed my plan. I evolved it. I kept going. Um, it does matter. And when I met with my probation officer yesterday, um, she again reiterated, your release plan is quite extensive and kind of laughing about it to a degree of like, yeah, that's really long. I don't know if she read it all the way through, but she knew the details and that's what mattered to me. She knew the personal details about it. She knew what, um, what I was trying to do, what I had accomplished. It, it helped a ton. When I put in my request for my job, um, it was going to be a hybrid job model where I was going to be working, but I was also going to be allowed time to be a dad again to my two kids. Um, so it was a little bit of a different request. Uh, my unit manager said yes. My parole officer said yes. Now I'm just waiting on the BOP to sign off on it as well. But it helped me get instant yeses from both those two key people, and I expect the BOP to follow suit. Um, I can't emphasize it enough that take the time, do the work for the release plan, you know, make multiple copies of it, have a person always have a copy of it, make sure you're updating it, follow through with it, it, it matters. Uh, thank, thank you for sharing that the key point 
but there's a lot of things that Ryan said are relevant, including following through. There are people who say they're going to do something in prison, they don't follow through. Part of the reason our team might film an interview with someone before they go in is to kind of document what you're going to do and then see if you're going to follow through. It's only the only way to deal with the cynicism. And even though all of the stakeholders bought into Ryan's plan, even if, you know, even if just one of them, you advance your agenda. We want all of them. We want the home run. But even if you get a single, are you further along? I think so. So while we can't guarantee it will have the influence that you like, I know if you don't try, you get nowhere. And our team has given you the, the resources and, and the, the skills to implement it. And we want you to do that. So, so Ryan, thank you. Next, I'm going to call on, on Amy, who contributed last week, but I did a total rookie move and forgot to hit record in time. So we lost all of Amy's remarks. But we're going to do it again. Amy, thank you for contributing. Give us a summary of, of Paul's situation and some of the benefits he has seen from the advocacy work that, that he did. Well, it follows right along with what Ryan just said. Uh, and and uh, it gives me uh, hope that perhaps his story will follow that. I would love to see my husband in four months uh, out of um, the prison camp, but um, any day, like his wife said, any day sooner is worth all the work. We didn't find um, prison professors until two weeks before he surrendered, but the work was done when he went in. And at his first meeting, uh, 28 days after his surrender, he presented the release plan to, which was about 10 to 13 pages. He presented it to his case manager and counselor and they were extremely impressed with it. They said that they had never seen anything so well done, so well documented about what he had done, was going to do, what he was doing currently, uh, that they were so impressed that they asked if he would teach a class on, because it looked like a resume and they wanted him to help other inmates learn how to build a resume that looked that good to help them get a job. Uh, so that was a lot of work. Michael had gone through the document with us line by line prior to his surrender. I mailed a copy to him. They let him walk in with it. And he left the meeting hopeful when he told me that other people sometimes leave the meeting upset, angry, disappointed. So all of the work that we had done, every, everything that we were told to do, the self-advocacy is spot on. Amy, when we had a call, right when we began working together, I, I think shared a story of someone, of a spouse who had recently reached out and said something like, you know, I love my husband, but I'm not gonna go see him for a, a little while because he's just not really making good use of his time and the visits are tough and I'm frustrated. So even if this, even if they threw his release plan in the trash and they said, we don't want you to teach a course. And I know you miss and love your husband, but isn't there a level of respect that comes from knowing he's working hard and following through and following through on his commitments, even if they threw the release plan in the trash, which they won't do. But I just want you to speak about, I know you don't want him there, but the respect that you have for him for doing all he can to, to prepare, because we don't always get those calls, as you would imagine. Correct. I do. We did touch on that last week. You could have a case manager who gives you the opposite reaction, doesn't want you to teach a class, doesn't really care about what the papers are in front of you. However, it's Again, self-advocacy, if my husband is doing all the work that he can to make that prison journey the most productive, then he's doing everything he's supposed to be doing to help himself and get home to his family. And whether they believe in that or not, and fortunately his case manager and counselor do, um, it's still important to, to do this because you are the only person who's really looking out for you during that journey when you're inside. Um, it's, it's all the work that you have to do. You have to do it for yourself because you are not going to stay there forever. If your sentence is like my husband's, he does have a release date. He will come home eventually and he has to be prepared for that as well. We, we thank you very much, Amy. We're grateful for you sharing your, your thoughts. We want all of you to know your perspective comes from where you are in the system. There are some people who feel like change isn't coming quickly enough, and that's your experience. In Michael's experience, for example, he served a very long time. 
he's very encouraged by changes within the, the Bureau of Prisons. Think about it for a moment. Michael served 26 consecutive years in prison and would get sent to the hole for writing books. Now, with change and reform and a new director, the same people that sent him to the hole are now welcoming him into prisons all across the country. And he's training both staff. Are some staff potentially reluctant? Maybe, I don't know. I'm so pleasantly surprised at how many are welcoming someone who served 26 consecutive years in prison into the prison to teach. And many of these case managers and counselors are welcoming the content with hopes they can convey and teach it to tens of thousands of inmates. That's, that's the change. So I know some of you might not get the response from your case manager. Maybe their, their mindset is that way back when they want to continue to peep, keep people locked up longer than they should. But I know based on what we're hearing from Amy and Ryan and Ron and others, that many of them are embracing this more reform mindset and more change is coming. So we want you to consider that. We can't guarantee that you'll have the response like Amy and Ryan had. I know if you don't try, you're not going to get closer to what you want. So I'm, it just requires doing the work. And as Michael frequently says, we would never ask you to do anything that our team has not done. And there's evidence, there's documentation of how we've done it. And it's the reason we are having the impact in these prisons and programs across the country, because we documented it. Follow our lead and you'll be successful. Well, I'm going to wrap up the webinar by turning it over to one more advocacy study. Many of you know Kent. He's actually on our team. But before joining our team, he was a client of, of our team at Prison Professors. So Kent, welcome. Talk us through your advocacy, what you were looking at, and what you received and why. For sure. So uh, it's been a quite a long journey. I'm kind of similar to Ron, I think, a bit, although I didn't go to trial. God bless you, my friend, for taking on that battle. Um, but basically, I, I got indicted almost four years ago, uh, made a lot of bad decisions with attorneys and didn't really know anybody that had ever gone through this before, like many. So a lot of ups and downs throughout and then ended up um, watching some videos and finding Justin and already it started to kind of give me a game plan of, all right, life's going to go on, like I'm going to be okay through this. But the guidance and support started to really make a big difference just personally. Um, and then there became the building of a plan. Um, started working in, in kind of arm in arm with my attorney, but at the same time, she wasn't necessarily on board to begin with, which I think is a good point to share to all of you. Um, realize you are your own best advocate. As Justin said, and many people will say through this, is they kind of have their part. They have their own kind of their legal battles that they should be going for. But I started to realize that if I wanted to get a different result, I really needed to start doing things differently. Um, and that started with a lot of preparation and planning where it's really never too late, whether you're even a week before sentencing or you've got preferably much further time for you can start to prepare and do the work. But I ended up taking a plea last March um, it was for health care fraud, and the government ended up in my plea asking for 57 to 71 months, and then ended up having a personal narrative, did my character reference letters, worked on my allocution statement over and over again, uh, had volunteer work. I mean, I really started to build my narrative and my story, um, and at sentencing, similar to Ron's story, I, I think a lot of people have asked me, what's the one thing that, you know, how did you get this result or what was, you know, what do you think impacted the judge the most? And honestly, it's impossible to tell. Um, she hit on everything that I had done from genuine remorse, my letters, the statements, the volunteer work, um, how I am as a father. I've got four kids just losing a job, finding another, everything, um, and ended up getting to 15. So the government asked 57 to 71, and I ended up getting sentenced to 15. And that was this past November. Um, we've since had a few extensions for my surrender, but I'm actually going to be surrendering to Morgantown Prison Camp at the end of April. But I kind of became, not kind of, I became very passionate about this and trying to help others. Um, I know my story is a bit unique. I don't know. There's no way to guarantee those kind of results and things and what have you. But similar to what Justin talks about through this and and Ryan and Amy and Ron, you guys are great proof of this. It's it's I had the comfort of knowing that I did all the work. So whether the result was in the 30s and 40s, which was kind of where I was expecting, I knew that I was going into sentencing with and I plan going 
I've done everything. Some of these things are out of your control. I was fortunate enough to get the 15 months, but I don't think it was really an accident. I did do the work. And now I've turned my focus on the release plan. So it's, I did all the work kind of before sentencing, got a nice result. Now it's the work that I'm doing as I'm preparing to go in. And at the same time as I'm preparing for myself, um, I'm trying to communicate and help with others that are going through this and, and can speak with empathy as, as, uh, as much as anything else and understand that this is a tough spot, but we're a nice community and a group that's doing this stuff together and it, and it pays off if you do the work. It, do, it does pay off. Thank you, Kent. And I, I want to address something that, that Abe wrote. This is relevant. He wrote, I'm not sentenced yet. When I write a release plan, I'm assuming that I will be spending time in prison, but my attorney is preparing a sentencing mitigation plan for probation. So he feels like I'm shooting myself in the foot, assuming I go to BOP. Your thoughts? I'm going to interpret the question as best I can. If you'd like to, to chime in and provide clarity, please do so. The advice that I'm going to give you comes not from me, I mean, we've learned a lot. We've been to, we've had a lot, helped a lot of people, been to a lot of sentencing hearings. The advice that I'm going to give you comes from federal judges we've interviewed, wardens with whom we've spoken with, federal probation chiefs we've interviewed, John Gustin, the head of halfway houses for more than 20 years. You can watch that interview. In fact, Scott, please, if you would put our subject matter expert link in the chat, because Abe needs to watch these videos, because I don't want you to think it's self-serving for me to give this answer so you can hop on the phone with our team. We'd love to help you. But I'm going to give you the answer that a warden or former chief of probation would, would give us. Your lawyer, we want him to create a beautiful sentencing mitigation package without question. But what we've learned from judges, videos you can watch, like Judge Boo, who said, and Judge Boo's a lawyer, he's a judge, that Judge Boo said he and other judges disc how what lawyers articulate because they're paid to say it. It's no disrespect to the lawyer. It's the same reason they may discount what the U.S. attorney says or some of it. They're paid to say it. Abe, a federal judge on stage said to the audience one time, if you're a bad father, your lawyer's paid to say you're a good father. If you had bad intentions, your lawyer's paid to say your conduct was aberrational, out of character. How do I know? They're paid to say it. So whether we help you or you do it on your own, regardless of the sentencing memorandum that your lawyer is referring to, in our experience, the defendant, as you've learned from Ron or Kent or Scott Laney, the defendant has to do the lion's share of the mitigation. You've got to articulate to a sentencing job, judge and probation officer why you're worthy of leniency through your own efforts and your own words. Because that sentencing memorandum your lawyer is mm -hmm. referencing, that's not going to go to a case manager in prison. You know what's going to go to a case manager in prison? Your probation report that's going to reflect bad things about you. So therefore, is your personal narrative in your probation report, according to judges we've interviewed, it should be why your case manager is Amy and Ryan articulated within 30 days, you're going to meet with your case manager. And that case manager is going to look at the release plan, but also your probation report. So we'd encourage you to hope your lawyer has a great memorandum. You've got to do the work. You need the narrative in your probation report. If you've already sat for your probation report and your narrative is not in there, you missed an opportunity. It's okay. Get it written. Get it to the probation officer. Why? Many judges rely upon the probation officer at a sentencing hearing. Judge Carter in Santa Ana, I've been to a dozen of his sentencing hearings where the probation officer zooms in and Judge Carter will say, you know, a probation officer, you've spent a lot more time with this defendant than I have. Tell me about him. What, should, what am I missing here? Help me understand. The government wants this. The defense attorney wants this. What's your opinion? Do you advance your agenda if you've done the mitigation? We think so. So I'll reiterate it, presuming I'm answering the question correctly. It's great your lawyers doing their own mitigation package by way of the memo. It is useless, in our opinion, if you've not done the lion's share of the mitigation, both at sentencing and also with what you plan to give to your case manager, and also your probation officer, because Chris Maloney in an interview you can watch said the first thing your probation officer is trained to do is to read your probation report. And it could be many years between the probation report and your release from prison. Are you changing the narrative? You can't rely on a lawyer's sentencing memo to do that. You've got to do that work. Hope I answered your question. Mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Or as Abe Lincoln said, work, work, work. Only you can do that work. Last but not least, I'm going to call on Scott Laney. Scott also uh, mitigated extensively. Scott, give us a couple of minutes about just your story and how you think the work could have advanced your release from prison. 
Sure. Ron, you and I are kindred spirits, my man. I also took it to trial and I, I made the drastic mistake of not beginning those mitigation efforts until after that date. But at least at least I began um, the government and the courts, I think, weren't too pleased with my decision to consume those resources in that time. Like most of you, I found the videos. I started watching them. I learned that there was a better way. Um, my attorney was diametrically opposed to me mitigating my on my own. He had said, we have a sentencing memorandum. I take care of all that. Don't worry about your probation interview. And I had to make the decision that it was my freedom on the line. And I began to put in the efforts. And I, I worked with the team and they helped me extensively. I went into my sentencing hearing quite nervous surrounding the amount of time I would receive. And as odd as it feels to say, I was absolutely thrilled when I was sentenced to 42 months in prison. And again, working with the release plan and all the preparations I had done on the front side, I was out of the prison in 13 and a half months, reported to the halfway house, was able to have the exact job I wanted, was very quickly sent to home confinement where I had a high level of liberty. And then that, that smooth record continued into probation, which um, I'm very grateful for, and I'm, I'm always working hard to prove worthy of that leniency, but probation has been very, very manageable for me, and I think that comes from the work that I did years ago that's paying off today. And, and lastly, I joked when we opened the webinar that Scott's been off on probation for about nine minutes, and in the last week, he's been to, from Idaho. He visited with our team here in California. And now he's in Florida. I don't know what's next, but the record that he created not only helped him get out of prison earlier, work with our team while he got approved to work with our team. So did Scott Brown there in Texas. I see you, Scott. Scott had many months in the halfway house. He volunteered and worked with our team as well. And now Scott's, both Scott's are on probation. They're free to travel and have just higher levels of liberty by virtue of the work that they uh, that they do now. And that's what I want. That's kind of like the takeaway from the self-advocacy webinar. There's a chance you may do work and it may not have the income that you like. And if that happens, I empathize with you. We hope that it influenced these stakeholders. Perhaps it influences one more than the other, but you get nowhere if you don't try. And our team strives to provide free resources that will help guide you and your family along the way. But it's more than just watching the webinar for an hour. It's the implementation. So I have a takeaway or challenge for all of you. I, I'd love it if someone, because we've sent you the release plan template. It's on the prison professor's website. It's there. I would love it if someone next week begins to create their release plan and contemplate sharing with us the release plan or start and then come with questions and we can address it. Because it's one thing to watch. It's another thing to do it, whether you do it on your own or you work with our team. Uh, that said, or if there are any questions, our team will answer them. And I'm very, we're all, I'm very grateful to Scott and Kent and Amy and Ryan and Ron, everyone for talking about your self advocacy efforts. Um, very, very grateful. That said, are there any questions we haven't, we haven't addressed? If not, we get on, get on with our day here. I love this webinar, having people share stories. Oh, Mr. Carper, thank you for your email. By the way, last week, many of you asked about. Scott Carper Donaldson's, uh, he writes an awesome newsletter. <laughs> it's awesome. We get it every Monday. I look forward to it. Like I, I, I know everyone in Scott's network does as well. Mr. Carper, you had mentioned that Scott's amenable to, to sharing it, but perhaps if we modify some information. So I'll coordinate that with you. But for everyone that asked, I'm going to work on a solution with Mr. Carper so you can get access to Scott's newsletter from, from Leavenworth. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very good. If that's still okay with you, Mr. Carper. It is. Okay, it's very, very cool. I like the design of it too, by the way. But Scott's been in for a little while and every week he writes this newsletter, regardless of what's happening, good or bad, he's doing it. That's accountability. That's saying you're going to do it and then doing it. That's what Scott Laney did. Um, it's just awesome. Just awesome. Any hands up? Any question? If not, we can transition into our weekend or the rest of the day. All right, thank you, Joanne. Please do email me. And by the way, if anyone wants, we have a, we can do an audio version of Earning Freedom that I encourage you to listen to. You'll be inspired by Michael's journey. That the book. Happy to send that to you, and you'll 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 hear it in action of what it takes to get through this crisis and plan. So feel free to email me. I'm going to put the email address up right now. JP at whitecollaradvice.com. 
and then and then we'll respond to you with the book. So Joanne and everyone, please do that so we can get you those free resources, okay? That said, we'll see all of you next week. Thank you for your attention and time. We're so grateful to join you on this journey, okay? Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'll see you next Thursday.